Tell me, Muse, about the man of many turns, who many ways wandered when he had sacked Troy's holy citadel. This is how Homer invoked the Muses before singing the story of the hero Odysseus, brave warrior who, with his shrewdness, helped the Greeks to cross the divine walls of Troy. Among all the heroes who survived the ravages of war, Odysseus was the only one who had not yet returned home. On Mount Olympus, the gods gathered in an assembly. Zeus, high on his throne, spoke about how men blame all their ills on the gods, when, in fact, most of their misfortunes were the result of their own choices and follies, and for that, they paid the price for their sins. At this point, Athena intervened and asked why Odysseus, the wise king of the island of Ithaca, even though he was God-fearing, continued to suffer away from his beloved homeland. The goddess lamented the hero's fate, who had been stranded for seven years on the island of Ogygia. There, the beautiful nympho Calypso, daughter of Atlas, was keeping him on her island because she wanted to have him as her husband. Zeus explained that he was not responsible for Odysseus not having returned home yet, but rather Poseidon, who felt hatred for the hero ever since he pierced the eye of the god's son. But at that moment, Poseidon was in faraway Ethiopia, where he was worshipped. Therefore, he did not participate in the assembly. With the approval of the Council of the Gods, Zeus decreed that Odysseus had the right to return to his home. Zeus's favorite daughter was pleased, stating that she would go to Ithaca to find Telemachus, Odysseus's son. Zeus ordered Hermes, the messenger god, to go to the island of Ogygia to order Calypso to free Odysseus. Hermes put on his winged sandals and set off to fulfill the god's wishes. The island of Ogygia was in the navel of the sea. It was a place where the vegetation grew exuberantly and the breeze blew gently, but strong waves pummeled its coastline. There, Calypso tried in every way to convince Odysseus to stay with her and even offered him immortality. But Odysseus knew that he was just a mere mortal. It was wrong to desire immortality, for his place was not among the gods, but beside his family. Hermes entered the cave where Calypso lived, being received by the nymph with all reverence. The divine messenger informed Calypso that, by order of Zeus, she was to free Odysseus and secure the means necessary for his journey. The nymph was enraged, saying that the Olympian gods were envious, that they were not pleased with the happiness of the lesser deities when they relate to mortals. But Calypso knew that she could do nothing against Zeus's will. Sometimes her heart broke when Odysseus cried and sighed with homesickness. After delivering the message, Hermes left, and the saddened Calypso went to meet Odysseus. As usual, Odysseus was by the sea, thinking about his beloved Penelope. Calypso told him to stop crying, for he could finally return home. Odysseus, surprised and skeptical, looked back suspiciously, telling the nymph that he could stay if that was her will. The nymph laughed at the wily Odysseus, who, although he wanted to return home more than anything else in his life, knew better than to anger a deity. She told him not to worry, for she spoke the truth. His time on the island of Ogygia was coming to an end. Calypso pointed out to Odysseus the places where he could find the materials needed to build a raft, as well as explaining to him the design of the boat, so that it could withstand the waves. Odysseus did everything as he was ordered, and finally the transport that would help him reach his home was ready. The nymph handed Odysseus supplies for the journey, telling him that, if he knew the dangers that still awaited him, he would have chosen to stay, but the king of Ithaca would not waste that opportunity. Odysseus and Calypso said goodbye, and with the help of favorable winds brought by Calypso, Odysseus set off toward his destination. In his precarious vessel, Odysseus braved the great sea that separated the European from the African peoples. His goal was to return to the arms of his beloved wife Penelope and reunite with his young son Telemachus. On the island of Ithaca, the kingdom of the fearless hero was in danger, for it had been years since the king had left for the War of Troy. Almost everyone believed that Odysseus had died in his venture. 
Odysseus's palace was full of suitors who wished to betroth the Queen Penelope and assume the vacant throne. The queen was no longer young, but still had incredible beauty. Young Telemachus, who was just a baby when his father left, was now a man. The suitors had chosen to stay in the palace, squandering Odysseus's fortune while waiting for Penelope to choose her new husband. Athena assumed the form of a seemingly noble man. In disguise, she entered the palace through the suitors who looked at the visitor with suspicion. Telemachus received the visitor with hospitality, just as Zeus had commanded men. The man said his name was Mentes, king of the Taphias, allies of Telemachus' father. Telemachus told the visitor about the chaos in his father's kingdom and how the suitors were squandering his inheritance. Finally, he asked if the visitor had any news of Odysseus. Mentes said he did not know Odysseus' exact location, but he was alive and doing everything he could to return home. The nobleman said that Telemachus should try to find clues to his father's whereabouts, for he was now a man and should take control of his destiny. Telemachus's heart felt great courage. Mentes assumed the form of a bird and took off. Witnessing that scene, the young man was sure that the gods were on his side. With the firmness and courage transmitted by the goddess, Telemachus announced to the suitors that the next day he would organize an assembly to decide the fate of his father's kingdom. Penelope realized that something had changed in her son. He was no longer a boy, and this filled her with pride. The next day, all the men of Ithaca gathered at the assembly called by Telemachus. The young man spoke about the chaos in his father's kingdom and scolded the suitors for depleting the missing hero's fortune. Antinous, one of the most insolent suitors, interrupted Telemachus, saying that the culprit for the whole situation was Penelope, who had deceived the suitors. Penelope had promised the suitors that as soon as she finished the shroud she was sewing for Laertes, Odysseus's father, she would choose her new husband. During the day, she would weave the shroud for her father-in-law, but as night fell, she would undo the work during the morning. Thus, for almost four years, she deceived the suitors until her trickery was discovered. The suitors claimed that they would hold consecutive banquets in Odysseus's palace until Penelope chose her new husband, even if it depleted Telemachus's entire inheritance. Telemachus threatened his rivals, warning that, because of this insult to hospitality, Zeus would ruin the suitors. Two eagles suddenly began a flight in the skies, an omen of something important. The soothsayer Halitherses interrupted the omen and told the suitors that the king was returning and the fate of his opponents would be terrible. Eurymachus, another renowned suitor, ignored the elders' words and said that, as soon as the assembly was over, they would again delight in Odysseus's possessions, for he was dead. Telemachus revealed the real reason for the assembly. He needed help to get a boat, men, and supplies for a trip to the island of Pylos in Sparta, where he would try to find clues to his father's whereabouts among the brothers-in-arms who fought alongside him at Troy. If unsuccessful, he would let his mother choose a suitor. No one supported the idea of Telemachus. Therefore, Mentor, the man Odysseus commissioned to take care of his family, scolded the people of Ithaca for showing such ingratitude to the family of the king, who was always kind and generous to them. The assembly was dissolved and Telemachus did not achieve his goal. At the seaside, Telemachus asked the goddess Athena for help in a prayer. She quickly answered. Athena assumed the form of mentor and assured the young man that she would give him the means necessary for his journey, for she perceived that the prince had the courage of his father. Obeying Mentor's directions, Telemachus asked the old servant Eurycleia for help in gathering supplies for the journey. Meanwhile, the goddess induced a deep sleep in the suitors so that Telemachus could escape in hiding. Telemachus boarded the ship that the disguised goddess had provided. Like his father, he set off bravely, leaving Ithaca behind to face the dangers and obstacles between him and his goal. 
After years trapped on the island of the nymph Calypso, Odysseus, guided by the stars, took his ship back to Ithaca. But Odysseus would not sail with impunity through the kingdom of Poseidon, who still had a lot of resentment for the hero, not having been at the divine assembly that ordered the return of the king of Ithaca. The god would pour out his wrath on him. The sea began to get rough, and Odysseus had to use all his skills as a sailor to fight the waves. The terrible ordeal imposed by Poseidon on Odysseus made him envious of the heroes who died at the gates of Troy. If he had fallen there, he would be exalted among men and not have the inglorious death that lay ahead of him. A great wave capsized his boat, throwing Odysseus into the water. In the waters he struggled to emerge, but everything indicated that that would be his end. He was about to give up when a female figure appeared and his will to live was renewed. Odysseus rose to the surface and managed to fill his lungs with air, while spitting out the salty water he had swallowed. He managed to cling to the remains of his ship, which had been destroyed by the waves. And over the wreckage, he saw a beautiful woman who could only be a goddess. The sea goddess was Leucothea, a deity who had been mortal. Therefore, she was very empathetic to the suffering of men. She asked Odysseus to remove his robes, which made swimming more difficult, while offering her handkerchief to Odysseus. Leucothea assured him that that handkerchief would help him reach dry land safely. Odysseus tied the handkerchief to his chest, as commanded by the goddess, and swam to the shore of the Phykes. Poseidon was pleased. That man had already suffered too many torments in the past years, it was time to allow the will of the Council of the Gods to be carried out. Poseidon would no longer pursue the King of Ithaca. Odysseus used all his strength to reach the beach and almost died when he was thrown by the sea against the rocks. But at last, he was protected on hospitable land. His first action on dry land was to return the handkerchief of the goddess Leucothea to the sea, she who saved him from certain death. The hero slept on a bed of leaves in the forest to regain his energy before seeking help in the unknown land. The next morning, he awoke to the sound of female voices, which seemed to be enjoying themselves. Among the trees, Odysseus saw a group of girls playing with a ball. Among them, one young woman stood out from the rest. The hero realized that she was a nanny to the other young women, and that this noble woman would probably tell him what place that was but his nakedness was an obstacle. Odysseus approached the young girls, using a branch with leaves to hide his private parts. The girls were startled by that scene, except for the noble and beautiful young woman. Odysseus knelt before the girl and said, I don't know if you are a goddess or a mortal. If you are a goddess, you seem to me to be Artemis, who stands out for her poise and beauty among the most beautiful nymphs in her retinue. If you are mortal, thrice blessed are your parents to birth a daughter who blossoms so splendidly. Flattered, the young woman said her name was Nausicaa and decided to help the man, telling her servants to give Odysseus robes. Clean and dressed in a beautiful robe, Odysseus looked like another man, different from the castaway the youngsters had found. Nausicaa was captivated by that elegant and seductive man. She wanted to introduce him to her father, King Alcinius of the Phykes, thinking about the possibility of making him her future husband. The princess pointed Odysseus the way to the city of the Phykes, but did not accompany him, for it would not be right for her to appear with a man in the city. At the city's entrance gates, Odysseus prayed that the gods would protect him and not let another barbarian people keep him from his goal. With Athena's protection, the hero was able to make his way to the palace without being harassed for being a foreigner. Upon reaching the palace, he knelt before Queen Arete, asking for assistance in returning home. Touched, the queen asked the king to receive the visitor with all hospitality, as required by Zeus. The king decided to offer all his hospitality. Odysseus was given a bed, and the next day, great festivities were organized in honor of the gods. 
athletic games were held to show how skillful and strong the Fikes were. Odysseus even showed his strength by throwing a discus. During the banquet held to honor the guest, the Eidos sang of the Greeks' achievements in the War of Troy. Odysseus listened to the poet with admiration, for he was certainly inspired by the muses. He sang the deeds of the heroes in such detail that he seemed to have been there. Odysseus wept remembering the war that had kept him away for so long from his beloved land and family. King Alcinous, who until then had not known that his guest was one of the heroes of the deeds sung by the Eidos, asked why those stories moved him so much. Odysseus said he would explain everything to the king, but he didn't even know where to start. The hero took a deep breath and finally revealed his identity. He said he was Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, who for ten years had fought alongside the bravest men before the great walls of Troy. Everyone was astonished at the revelation. Odysseus said he would tell his hosts about the adventures and hardships that caused him much pain. It all started after he and his men left Troy behind. This is how Odysseus's adventures began. After ten years of war, thanks to Odysseus's wit, the city of Troy had finally been captured and pillaged. The king of Ithaca and his men, after years of fighting before the walls of Troy, were ready to return home. Odysseus and his squadron of twelve ships were sailing alongside the squadron of the great hero Agamemnon, until they were separated by a great storm. The storm blew Odysseus's men off course, taking them close to the country of the Sicones. These people allied themselves with the Trojans during the war, being responsible for the deaths of many Greeks. His crew demanded revenge against their enemies. In a surprise attack, Odysseus and his men pillaged the city of Ismarus, killing the warriors who resisted and enslaving those who did not flee. But the invasion of the island by the men of Ithaca would not go unpunished. The men and women who fled the city ran to the neighboring towns and cities in search of reinforcements. Meanwhile, Odysseus tried in vain to get his men to return to the ships, but they were determined to celebrate the newly won spoils. That's when one of the lookouts warned that an army was approaching. Odysseus's battalion had more than a hundred experienced warriors. With several years of fighting in Troy, they were not afraid to fight. The battle began, and Odysseus felt foolish to be fighting again in an unnecessary conflict, even after achieving ultimate glory in Troy. The men of Ithaca fought like lions against more numerous enemies, but the countless amounts of Siconian warriors made victory impossible. Odysseus ordered a retreat, and his men fled to their ships. The ships quickly fled the lands of the Sicones, and each ship lost six brave warriors in vain. But the hero's adversities had only just begun. A strong wind tore the sails of the ships, leaving his vessels at the mercy of the sea currents. His men worked at mending the sails, wanting to find their way home as quickly as possible. With the sails already sewn up, they found an unknown island, heading for it to supply the ships with drinking water. On land, Odysseus ordered three of his men to scour the island to find out who the resident people were. The ships were already stocked, and the scouts had yet to return. Odysseus then led a search quest. The hero was unaware that his men had been welcomed by the natives and were entitled to taste an exotic food. They had been offered lotus flowers and fruits. When Odysseus met them, they were eating the lotus fruit with great satisfaction. A compatriot greeted him as if he were a foreigner and gave him the exotic fruit. Odysseus looked suspiciously at the fruit, which looked quite appetizing. The man, who had lived with his king for the past ten years, seemed not to recognize him, and Odysseus realized that this could only be caused by some toxin in the fruit. The king of Ithaca tried to convince the men to return with him to the ships, but they wished to stay there, eating lotus for the rest of their lives. Odysseus ordered his men to forcibly drag their colleagues back to the ships while they were begging to stay. These men were tied up and put back on the ships. 
The squadron departed, leaving the island of the Iotophagi behind, while its lotus-eating inhabitants waved, before eating the fruit that would make them forget about those visitors. Meanwhile, one of Odysseus's men was crying, for he wished only to eat the lotophagus fruit to forget all the horrors he had witnessed in the war. But Odysseus's men would encounter even more terrible images during their return home. Odysseus and his men spent several days without seeing solid ground in their heroic attempt to return home when they finally found an island on the horizon. It was the famous island of the Cyclops, one-eyed creatures, sons of Poseidon, the mighty god of the seas. Odysseus wanted to meet the island's inhabitants and chose 12 of his best men to explore the island with him. They found a large cave and the sound of screeching sheep could be heard from inside. Upon entering the cave, Odysseus realized that this was the home of one of the beings that inhabited the island. Inside the cave, there was an enclosure with some sheep, amphorae filled with goat's milk and bowls with fresh cheese made from it. Odysseus tasted some of the cheese and thought about stealing it, but decided to wait for the return of the cave dweller and negotiate with him. But the hero would regret this decision. The huge cyclops appeared in front of the cave, bringing with him part of his herd that he had taken out to graze. Odysseus and his men hid, fearing for their lives. But the hiding places of the sailors were revealed when the cyclops lit a fire in the center of the cave. Odysseus came out of his hiding place and introduced himself to the monster, saying who he was and what he was doing there by asking for hospitality. The Cyclops said that his name was Polyphemus, the most glorious of his race. He claimed that he owned no hospitality to inferior beings, for he did not recognize the laws of men. Polyphemus grabbed two of Odysseus's men by the legs and slammed them to the ground, killing them immediately. As if this weren't enough, the beast still devoured them completely. The mighty Cyclops moved a huge stone and blocked the exit of the cave. After that nasty meal, the Cyclops decided to sleep. Odysseus's men wanted to kill him while he slept, but the cunning leader stopped them because it would be impossible to move the heavy stone blocking the cave exit. The next day, the giant took his sheep out to pasture, leaving the men locked in the cave. Odysseus, together with his men, planned a way to avenge the death of his colleagues. They found a large log of wood and sharpened one end. At the end of the day, the Cyclops returned and, after re-entering, closed the exit of the cave. Odysseus poured into a jar the wine from the wineskins of all his men to offer it to the one-eyed giant. Polyphemus drank with satisfaction the strong wine offered by Odysseus and liked the gesture. He told the hero that, as a reward, he would be the last to be devoured and asked Odysseus his name. He replied that his name was Nobody and that everyone knew him that way. Drunken Polyphemus felt an irresistible urge to sleep. Odysseus and his men took the makeshift weapon and prepared their revenge. They ran with the sharp stake toward the monster's one eye. The Cyclops woke up and screamed in pain. After hearing his brother's terrible screams, two other Cyclops appeared at the entrance to the cave. They asked who had done it, and Polyphemus shouted, Nobody, nobody has pierced my eye. Since there was no one to punish, they returned to their homes. The next day, the blind Cyclops let the animals out to graze, but he did not expect Odysseus to use another trick. Clinging to the bellies of the strong rams, Odysseus and his men managed to escape Polyphemus's cave. When they were all out of the cave, they quickly ran to the ships. On the ship, Odysseus shouted at the monster, saying that being blinded was a deserved punishment for a criminal who disregarded Zeus's designs by devouring those who had asked for hospitality. Polyphemus pulled a large chunk out of a mountain and threw it in the direction of Odysseus's cries. The great rock fell near the ship of the king of Ithaca. 
His men begged him to stop taunting the beast, but Odysseus continued. He shouted again, saying that, when someone asked him who had pierced his eye, he should answer that it was the man who devastated the city of Troy, son of Laertes, the great Odysseus, the king of Ithaca. The furious Polyphemus threw another boulder at Odysseus's ship, and it grazed the ship of the Greeks. Odysseus walked away from the island of the Cyclops, regretting that he had lost some men, but excited that he had overcome a huge challenge. Polyphemus asked his divine father and begged Poseidon to punish the man responsible for piercing his son's eye. He asked that the god of the seas prevent Odysseus from returning home. If the gods so willed, he should wander the seas for years, arriving home without ship, treasure, and companions. Odysseus's haughtiness, which led him to mock the son of Poseidon, would cost him dearly, for he now had the god of the seas as an enemy. Days after leaving the island of the Cyclops, Odysseus's fleet found a floating island that was not attached to land. There was only a splendid bronze palace on top of a hill. The king of Ithaca and his men disembarked on the island, setting off in the direction of the residence of the island's inhabitants. Odysseus met Aeolus, the guardian of the winds, who cordially welcomed the visitors. During the banquet in honor of their illustrious visitors, Aeolus and his sons listened cheerfully to Odysseus, who narrated to them the great deeds of the heroes during the Trojan War. To thank them for the entertainment, Aeolus opened a large wineskin and placed inside it all the winds, except for Zephyr, which would blow quietly to guide Odysseus and his men to their home. The favorable wind drove the hero ships close to home. After sighting the island of Ithaca, Odysseus could see the smoke from the chimneys. Relaxing for a moment, he entered the realm of Hypnos, the god of sleep, and started snoozing. Odysseus's men were unhappy to return home with virtually no spoils of war. They envied Odysseus for having received a big bag from the gods. They wanted to know what kind of treasures were in the bag. They imagined that there was a lot of gold, so they opened the wineskin. After they opened the bag, all the winds came out and seemed furious. Odysseus awoke, startled by the great noise made by the strong winds. The winds caused great waves and gathered storm clouds, pushing the ships far from home. Odysseus, feeling disillusion and frustration, thought of throwing himself into the sea and ending all that suffering, but eventually regained his sanity. They returned to the island of Aeolus seeking help, but they were driven away by the ruler. He would not disregard the will of the gods, who certainly did not wish Odysseus to return home. Odysseus and his men fought against the winds, which seemed to carry them further and further away from home. After a long time at sea, they found a new island. On it was a protected area, where almost all of Odysseus's ships could find shelter. Only the hero ship was moored outside the bay, as there was no more room. Odysseus ordered two men to inspect the island and find out who its inhabitants were. They found a child, who was bigger than a normal adult, and asked him to take them to his ruler. They were taken to a large house, where a giant queen welcomed them. The queen called her husband, who was huge and had a menacing appearance. He grabbed one of Odysseus's men and devoured him immediately. His partner escaped and ran to the ships. Meanwhile, the king of the giants, known as Lystragonians, called the others to hunt the little men. The giants attacked the men and their ships in the bay as they tried to escape. The giants grabbed the men and sank their ships, throwing huge stones. The men who were not devoured immediately ended up trapped to be eaten later. By failing to dock in the bay, only Odysseus's ship escaped the massacre. His fleet now consisted of only one ship. Everyone in it mourned the loss of the brave friends who had survived the Trojan War, but perished before terrible creatures. Odysseus's entire fleet, which had set sail from Ithaca for Troy, had been destroyed in his attempt to return home after the war. Only Odysseus's captaincy ship escaped the tragedy. 
After a long time of sailing aimlessly on the sea, they found a beautiful island. But this did not gladden the hearts of the men of Ithaca, for they were traumatized by their last experiences on the island of the Cyclops and the Lestragonians. The men set up camp on the beach, but the soldiers' low morale left them inert and without the courage to explore the island. But Odysseus grabbed a bow and set off after a prey for dinner. Due to the grace of the gods, Odysseus found a small deer. Using his exceptional marksmanship, he brought the animal down with a perfect shot. As he was returning to the beach with the animal's carcass on his back, he spotted a puff of smoke on the other side of the island. The men of Ithaca were overjoyed to see the king return with precious food. But these smiles quickly vanished when Odysseus ordered the formation of an expedition to find out who lived on that island. The hero did not wish to be responsible again for sending more men to their deaths. Therefore, the chosen ones would be elected by the gods through a lottery. The group of men led by Eurylochus went out to find who oversaw the island. They found a beautiful palace, but the entrance was filled with wolves and lions, which terrified the men. But to the explorers' amazement, these creatures seemed as docile as pets. Suddenly, one of the men heard the singing of a woman coming from inside the palace. A beautiful woman was singing as she weaved. She was Circe, daughter of Helios and Percy. She had an enchanting beauty. Circe stood up and welcomed her visitors, inviting them in. She asked the guests to share a magnificent feast with her. Odysseus's men enjoyed the splendid delicacies offered by the lady, while Circe filled their cups with a magic potion. Suddenly, one of the men tried to speak, and his throat emitted a horrendous animalistic sound. The terrified visitors began to undergo a metamorphosis. A large snout started to appear on their faces, and their hands were replaced by split hooves. Circe had turned all the visitors into pigs, and with her staff, she led them into the pigsty. But as a precaution, Eurylochus had not entered the palace, suspecting a trap. He was an eyewitness to that grotesque scene. Eurylochus desperately told everything he witnessed to Odysseus, who promptly set out to rescue them. Eurylochus begged Odysseus not to go to Circe. He recommended that they leave that island immediately, before they were all turned into pigs or worse. But Odysseus felt it was his duty to try to save the few men he had left, even if it cost him his life, and he set off. On his way through the forest, he met a young man. This was Hermes, the messenger of the gods. Hermes related exactly what had happened to Odysseus's men. He said that the same would happen to him if he did not take precautions during his journey. The god gave the king an antidote to the sorceress's potion. He advised him to threaten her vigorously to make her submit once she brandishes the staff. Eventually, she would attempt to invite him into her bed. Odysseus was to accept and win her friendship to free his countrymen. But first, she would have to swear that she would not try to do him any more harm. Odysseus drank the antidote and proceeded towards the palace. Circe was excited by the arrival of yet another visitor, welcoming him kindly. She led Odysseus to a beautiful throne where he could rest and where he was served a refreshing drink. Odysseus took the potion offered by his hostess, who looked on excitedly as he drank all the liquid from the golden cup. Then Circe touched the hero with her staff and ordered him to head for the pigsty, for that was where the pigs were. But Odysseus was immune to her charms, and he pushed the staff away, threatening Circe with his sword. With a seductive look, the lady asked Odysseus to spare her life and invited him to share her bed. Odysseus said he would accept the invitation, provided she swore not to attempt his life or do any harm. Circe took the oath, and the king of Ithaca and the sorceress were united in the divine bed. The next day Odysseus was very well treated by the nymphs who cleaned and dressed him. Circe was sitting at the table waiting for the king. A great feast had been served, but he said it would be unworthy to eat while his men lived in a dump like pigs. Circe went to the pigsty and used her powers to restore the pigs to their previous form. Odysseus was amazed by the scene, noting that his companions seemed to be younger and healthier than before. 
the men embraced and celebrated their return to their former form. Circe was magnanimous to the men who entered her domains. She invited them to stay until they felt ready to move on. Odysseus and his men stayed on Circe's island for a year, enjoying the hospitality of their divine hostess. But one day, the warriors of Ithaca pressed the hero to return home. Odysseus confessed to Circe his desire to leave. She replied that she did not want to keep him there against his will. But before he could head home, Odysseus was to visit one of the most frightening places in the world. The hero was to go to the realm of Hades in search of answers. On the island of Circe, Odysseus and his men spent their last night before sailing off to a nightmarish destination. They were due to go to the terrifying realm of Hades to encounter the fortune teller Teresias' spirit and find out if it would be safe to return home. Elpinor, one of Odysseus' comrades, slept on the roof of Circe's palace to avoid the heat, but he would wake up dazed and, having forgotten that he was on the roof, he fell off the top of the roof, breaking his neck. Then Odysseus and his men grieved the loss of yet another shipmate, but they had no time to waste, and so they set off in their boat toward the kingdom of Hades. They landed at a place on the edge of the world, close to the land of the Cimmerians. That spot was shrouded in a thick mist. Once there, they disembarked, bringing the animals offered by Circe to be sacrificed. When they arrived at the exact place designated by the sorceress, Odysseus performed the sacrifice of two lambs, and their blood was poured into a pit. Odysseus and his men proceeded to be surrounded by spirits who wanted to drink the blood inside the den, but Odysseus was advised to chase them away until Tererius appeared. Much to everyone's surprise, between the spirits was Elpinor, the friend they had just lost. He still had not been buried, and so he requested Odysseus to promise him that he would grant him due burial honors. The Ithaca king assured him that he would do so. Next, the spirit of Odysseus' mother appeared. She had been alive when the hero left for the Trojan War, and the vision of his mother in that place broke the king of Ithaca's heart, and tears welled up in his eyes. Then old Tiresias appeared, who had been a master sage in life. He asked to drink from the blood of the pit Odysseus made. He quenched his thirst with the blood of the animals, and with blood still on his lips. Tiresias explained that Odysseus would encounter many more hurdles before he could return home. Poseidon harbored hatred for the hero for having wounded his son, the Cyclops Polyphemus. The soothsayer predicted that Odysseus would still be able to return home, but if his men disregarded the beasts of the god Helios, the king would get home alone on a foreign ship, as all of his comrades would perish on the way. But Odysseus was astonished to find Agamemnon there, the greatest leader of the Greeks during the Trojan War. He was assassinated by his wife after returning home from the war. There he also met the great hero Achilles, who appeared to have become embittered. Odysseus told him how his achievements in the Trojan War were reckoned and commemorated among men. But Achilles said that he preferred a thousand times to be a meager peasant and be allowed to see the light of day than to be the lord of the world of the dead. He also wondered how his son Neoptolemus was doing. Odysseus told him that he battled in the Trojan War and had proven himself a true disciple of Ares, accomplishing great deeds. Several others of his battle brothers would appear, such as Patroclus, Ajax, and others. But the mission of Odysseus in that land was finished, and so he and his men returned to the ship, heading back to the island of Circe to accomplish the promise made to Elpinor. Once there, they laid their friend's body on a pyre so that his spirit could ultimately rest in peace. During the farewell banquet thrown by the sorceress, she would whisper in Odysseus's ear the horrendous dangers he was about to face. The hero and his men would soon confront the most dangerous things that the kingdom of Poseidon had to offer. 
After his run-in with the soothsayer Tiresias in the underworld, it was prophesied that Odysseus would succeed in returning home. But he would still face nightmarish challenges before that. The sorceress Circe warned Odysseus of the dangers he would still encounter, but the Ithaca king preferred not to fully disclose them to his comrades, for he feared their hearts would be seized with dread. The first challenge was the mermaids, hybrid creatures but with an incredible power of seduction. Their song was irresistible to all who heard it and attracted their victims to their damnation. Odysseus ordered his men to plug their ears with wax so that they would be unable to hear anything at all. Favorable winds were driving them near the mermaid's island. But Odysseus was gripped by curiosity and wanted the opportunity to hear such irresistible singing. He ordered his men to tie him rigidly to the ship's mast, and even if he gave the order, his men would not release him until they were far from the island. Towering over the rocks, the beautiful mermaids sang and waved, attempting to lure the men to certain death. Scattered around them were countless bones of those who had been bewitched. Odysseus cried out for his men to free him and lead the boat towards the rocks, but they paid no heed to his orders. The sirens flattered the hero in their songs, who had achieved great things in the Trojan War and promised to write songs that would make his deeds immortal. Odysseus pleaded with his men to set him free, but they only tied the hero even more strongly to the mast. It was only when they were already at a safe distance from the island that Odysseus's companions pulled him free. The king of Ithaca took a while to recover mentally from that desperate experience. But now they were faced with a deadly challenge, as they would encounter two of the greatest dangers of the ocean, Scylla and Charybdis. A gigantic whirlpool was attempting to pour all the water out of the seas. This underwater creature was trying to engulf any vessel that came within its reach. To avoid the monster, Odysseus ordered his men to steer the ship as close as possible to a cliff. However, nestled in a huge cavern encrusted in the cliff was Scylla, a gigantic hideous beast. It had several heads and tentacles. Just the sight of it made the men desperate. The creature plucked the men from the ship's deck and tore them to pieces. Survival spirit was what kept the men rowing vigorously, avoiding being pulled by Charybdis and pulling themselves away from Scylla. Odysseus and his men dodged that death trap, but now they were only a handful of warriors when compared to the army that had traveled to Troy 20 years ago. Ahead of them lay the island of Thrinacia, the one which was to be Odysseus's last stopover before he could finally return home. Odysseus and his men were sailing near the island of Thrinacia, from whence they heard the mooing of the cows and oxen that lived there. Odysseus's comrades yearned for supplies and rest, but the king of Ithaca was told by Circe that that island might bring complete ruin to his men. He attempted to convince them to move away from the island. However, his men were greatly disgruntled, even to the point of mutiny. Odysseus consented to take them there, as long as they promised not to touch the cattle on that island, which was owned by the god Helios. They agreed and headed for the beach. Shortly after sheltering the ship in a cave to protect it from the winds, a storm raged over the island. Odysseus informed his men that they were to consume only the supplies offered by the sorceress Circe, while leaving Helios' animals in peace. Inclement weather and unforgiving winds kept Odysseus stranded on that island for months. The supplies were very close to running out. Odysseus said it was best for his men to try to fish and gather whatever berries and roots they could find, but to keep away from the sun god's oxen. While on one of his hunts, the hero reached the top of a hill. Feeling close to the gods, he asked them to help him. He felt as if the gods had sent him a peaceful sleep, and right there he took a nap. He would wake up smelling the distinctive aroma of roasting meat. 
Nearby, his men were grilling calf meat, as they had slaughtered the best animals to appease the gods' wrath. They would rather bear the risk of divine vengeance than the ordeal of starving to death. Odysseus was desperate to witness the scenario he had feared so much. The revenge of the gods would come soon. In heaven, the sun accused men of profaning his sacred cattle. He said that he would go to Hades to illuminate the dead, while the earth and heavens would no longer see his light. Zeus pleaded with Helios not to stop illuminating the world, as he would end the lives of those responsible for such a crime. The headwind ceased, and Odysseus and his men set off, leaving the island of Thrinacia behind. But the thunderbolts in the sky pointed to Zeus's foul mood. A powerful lightning strike shattered the shipmast, collapsing on the helmsman. Further lightning struck the ship, utterly destroying it. Many of Odysseus's men died by electrocution, while others drowned in the seawaters. Laertes's son survived by grabbing onto the planks of the ship's wreckage. He would be the only one not to have his body swallowed by the sea. He would drift for a while until realizing that the currents were taking him towards a dreadful fate. Odysseus was once again heading for the gorge of Scylla and Shardis. The wreckage was being tugged by Shardis's whirlpool, and his end seemed inevitable. But he managed to reach the branches of a fig tree that sprang up by the walls. Hanging from it, the hero waited until Shardis had swallowed all the water as he always did. The water flow reversed, and Odysseus jumped onto the debris spewed out by Shardis, using the strength of his arms and legs as he attempted his best to distance himself from that place. For days Odysseus was adrift at sea, until he was carried to the shores of the Ogygia Island, where the nymph Calypso lived. After describing his stay on Calypso's island, and how he had arrived in the land of the Phaeacians, Odysseus concluded his adventures at the court of King Alcinous. Overwhelmed with emotion, Odysseus felt in his heart the pain of recalling that almost all of his companions who perished on his journey cried out for his name in despair before they took their last breath. While Odysseus was trying to return home, his son Telemachus had departed for the Greek region of the Peloponnese in search of his father. He had the goddess Athena by his side, disguised as a mentor. His first stop was Pylos, the kingdom of the wise old Nestor, a famous hero from the Trojan War. The old king and his two sons were making sacrifices to the god Poseidon. They invited the young man and his chaperone to join them in the ceremony. Telemachus introduced himself as Odysseus' son, and Nestor was happy to meet the young man his father had mentioned so much. Unfortunately, however, Nestor had no news of Odysseus. He only knew that the Ithaca king was one of the four great heroes who had not made it home safely soon after the war ended. The mighty king Agamemnon had been murdered by his wife and her lover. Ajax the Great had died on the seas due as a result of the gods' rage, and Menelaus had been lost for eight years before returning home, but he knew nothing about Odysseus' whereabouts. The wise Nestor recognized that Telemachus was quite a valuable person, for he had the goddess Athena by his side. He recommended that the prince of Ithaca meet with Menelaus, as he would know some news of his father. The king of Pylos asked his son to accompany Telemachus to Sparta, where Menelaus and his queen reigned. They arrived during the festivities of the betrothal of Princess Hermione, daughter of Menelaus and Helen, to Neptolemus, the son of Achilles. The two young nobles were received with hospitality by the king, although the latter was unaware of their identity. He was only fulfilling Zeus's designs. But Menelaus noticed on the young man's face the features of his former battle companion. The queen, once known as Helen of Troy, also recognized Odysseus's presence in his son's features. Telemachus introduced himself and told her the reason for his visit. Menelaus asked him to sit down, for he had a story to tell. Menelaus said that his departure from Troy was difficult, since the Greeks had angered the gods. So, like Odysseus, he was lost at sea for a long time. But the ships reached the Egyptian coast. 
On this piece of land, he was plagued by depression until he was seen by a sea deity who took pity on him. The Nereid Edothea told Menelaus what he needed to do to return home. He was to gather some men and ambush Proteus, a sea deity with prophetic powers. They were to seize him and release him only when he promised to answer their inquiries. Following Idothea's orders, Menelaus found Proteus counting his seals before taking a nap. Menelaus and his men jumped on the god and grabbed him. He was strong and fought his way free of his attackers. Proteus had the power of metamorphosis and used it to assume the most diverse forms. Finally, due to the persistence of Menelaus who would not let go of him, he surrendered to the wills of the Spartan king and promised to tell everything he knew. Proteus told Menelaus that if he wanted to return home, he should make a sacrifice to the gods to appease their anger. Menelaus asked about the fate of the other Greek nobles who had returned from Troy. He told of the tragedy of Ajax, but the news of his brother Agamemnon's death broke his heart and the Spartan broke down in tears. The god also revealed the fate of his great friend, the king of Ithaca. Finally, Menelaus told Telemachus the information he had. Odysseus had sailed for a long time aimlessly throughout the Mediterranean Sea. He had been stranded for several years on the island of the nymph Calypso, but this would not be a permanent situation, for he was destined to return home. Telemachus told of suitors who were squandering his father's estate and wished to conquer his throne. Menelaus advised the prince to return home, for his father would need Telemachus' help. Together they would teach the suitors a lesson. Having left the land of the Phaeacians behind, King Alcinius made provisions for one of his ships to take the hero back to Ithaca. He would never forget his host's hospitality. Odysseus was gripped by a deep slumber and slept through the entire journey. When he reached Ithaca's beaches of Dexus, the sailors had no courage to wake him, so they disembarked him with the gifts offered by the Phaeacian king. When Poseidon heard that his enemy had finally reached his homeland, he was enraged and the sailors who carried the hero would pay a high price for dishonoring the god of the seas. Just as they were concluding their return journey, the ship of the Phaeacians was pulverized by Poseidon, who in a gigantic form smashed it with his bare hands. Upon parting his hands, there was only a large boulder in front of the Phaeacians' harbor. They had become a rock, and from that day on, the Phaeacians never again assisted castaways. In Sparta, Athena warned Telemachus that it was time to return home. The suitors planned to trap him on his return. For that reason, he was to sail at night and not head for the port, but to the home of Eumaeus, the man who raised him in Odysseus's absence. Eventually, Odysseus woke up and had no idea where he was. He feared that he was again in an unknown foreign land fraught with danger. It was then that a young shepherd boy appeared, and Odysseus inquired what place that was, and the young man said Ithaca. Cunning Odysseus, to disguise his identity, made up a story full of details which gave him a new biography. Meanwhile, the young man listened to his story with a smile on his face. At this point, the young man took the form of the goddess Athena, who said that his story was of unequaled astuteness and that it would almost fool even the goddess of wisdom. The goddess told him that he would have to seek out the loyal Eumaeus and bring himself up to date with the situation in his kingdom. But first, he needed a disguise. The goddess arranged for Odysseus to adopt the form of an old beggar, and he made his way towards the house of Eumaeus, the swineherd. Eumaeus abided by the duty of hospitality and welcomed the beggar with warmth. The pig keeper told him about how the suitors squandered Odysseus's fortune and intended to kill Telemachus and betroth the Queen Penelope. That was when footsteps were heard approaching the house of Eumaeus. Odysseus understood that the dog gave no alarm, and so it must have been someone known. The young Telemachus came through the door and was greeted cheerfully by the pig man, who said the prince's name. Odysseus's jaw dropped 
and his eyes grew wide at the sight of his grown son. More than twenty years had passed since he had last seen him. Telemachus told the pig man he ought to go to the palace to tell him secretly about his return. As soon as the pig man left, the figure of the goddess Athena appeared behind Telemachus, but only Odysseus and the dogs could see her. She told Odysseus that the time had come to reveal himself. Athena restored Odysseus to his original form, much to Telemachus's astonishment, who believed that the old man could only be a god. Odysseus told them that he was not a god, but actually his father, who had been missing for a long time. Father and son embraced, and many tears were shed from Telemachus and Odysseus's eyes. Odysseus wondered who and how many were the suitors who were trying to claim his rights. The young man said that there were dozens, and victory over them would be almost impossible. Odysseus instructed his son not to tell anyone about his father's return, not even Eumaeus and his mother. He said he should fear nothing, for Zeus and his beloved daughter were on their side and would lead them to glory. Again in the form of an old beggar, Odysseus went to the palace to beg among the suitors and know who they are and what their enemies had been planning. Odysseus went to Ithaca's royal palace alongside the swineherd Eumaeus, but before he reached the palace, he had an unexpected reunion. Lying on the ground was old Argos, Odysseus's dog, to which he had devoted much affection and time to turn it into an excellent herding and hunting dog, when the animal was still a puppy. Upon seeing the beggar approaching, the dog raised its ears and wagged its tail. Even twenty years later, the animal recognized its master immediately and would have run to him if it had not been too weak. Odysseus asked Eumaeus why the animal was so badly treated. The swineherd replied that the dog was unbeatable at herding and hunting. But, like the kingdom of Ithaca, it had lived through years of neglect, and so there were no signs left of its glorious times. Odysseus knelt down and shed a tear upon meeting his old and loyal friend again. After twenty years of waiting for Odysseus's return, Argos ended its vigil and could rest on the other plane. Its master had returned to take care of what was his. Odysseus entered the palace. Dozens of suitors were eating and drinking at the expense of the king of Ithaca's estate. The hero begged among the suitors to identify the good and bad. But Antonius, the most prominent of the suitors, wanted to expel the beggar from the palace. Odysseus retorted, saying that he ate and drank at another man's expense, but still refused to share even a fraction. Outraged by the visitor's insolence, Antonius threw a wooden seat at the beggar. Despite the powerful impact, Odysseus was strong and absorbed the blow without any reaction. The other suitors told Antonius that he had not been correct. Sometimes the gods would disguise themselves to test men's hospitality, and their revenge could be grim. Odysseus sat on the floor to eat the leftovers the suitors dropped off. Suddenly, Arneas entered the palace, a well-known local beggar. He was burly and aggressive. He was irritated to see another beggar occupying his place. He advanced against Odysseus, telling him to leave, for it was not his place there. Odysseus told him not to overreach. Despite his age, he could still beat him up, so they could both be left alone in the palace. The suitors were entertained by the bickering between beggars, challenging them to fight each other. Antonius replied that only the winner of the fight would have the right to beg in the palace, as the other would have to leave. With no alternative, Odysseus accepted the fight. Arneas was strong, but he was surprised to see Odysseus's muscles when Odysseus removed his cloak. The burly beggar set out to attack Odysseus, but he was knocked out by a single blow to the neck. The victorious Odysseus was cheered by the suitors, who had fun at the beggar's expense. The disguised king was greeted by one of the several suitors. Odysseus, realizing that he was not a bad person, warned him to leave the palace to escape his wrath. But the young man did not listen to him. Queen Penelope suddenly appeared. Thanks to the goddess Athena, who bathed her with ambrosia, she looked beautiful. Odysseus was delighted to see his wife again after twenty years. Although she no longer had her youthful features, 
she still retained an enormous beauty. But Penelope's stunning gorgeousness also aroused the suitor's desire. Antonia said that their patience was running out. Therefore, the next day, she was to choose her new husband. Odysseus talked with Telemachus and asked him to remove from the main hall all the weapons displayed on the walls. In this way, they would proceed with their revenge. While the young man was removing the weapons, he was questioned by a suitor who asked him what he was doing. Telemachus said that the weapons were being removed to be cleaned and polished. After all, they had not been maintained for many years. Meanwhile, Penelope questioned the visitor to learn more about him and to obtain possible information about her husband. The disguised king said that Odysseus was about to return, and Penelope wept with emotion. In gratitude, the queen asked her old servant Eurycleia to wash the visitor's feet. To the old maid's surprise, she recognized an old scar that the king of Ithaca had suffered in a hunt when he was young. Eurycleia knew that that man could only be Odysseus. Odysseus contained the maid so that she would not blow his cover. She promised the king that she would keep the secret, even from the queen. Penelope told Odysseus about her dream. Twenty geese were roaming and messing up the palace courtyard, and she was forced to feed them. Then an eagle appeared and killed all the geese. The beggar told her that her dream could not be clearer. Odysseus would return and pour out his terrible vengeance on the suitors. But sadness plagued Penelope's heart. With the arrival of the goddess of dawn, the time would also come for her to choose a match among the suitors. The day came when Penelope would finally have to choose her new husband among the suitors. They were already once again ravaging Odysseus' estate, feasting on his goods. Inspired by the goddess Athena, Penelope came up with Odysseus' bow. She would set suitors a challenge, which was to be overcome by whoever wanted to be her husband. They were to bend Odysseus' bow and shoot an arrow through the hole of twelve axes lined up. Telemachus asked to be the first to try. If he achieved that feat, his claim to the throne would be further legitimized. The young man tried three times to bend Odysseus's bow, but without success. On the fourth attempt, just as he was about to succeed, Telemachus looked at his father and understood the message in the man's gaze. He gave up and said he couldn't do it. The suitors began to try to bend Odysseus's bow. One after another, they failed. Odysseus revealed his identity by showing his scar to the pygmy swineherd Eumaeus and his servant Philetus, who had always been very loyal to the king. The two subjects were very excited to see Odysseus again. He asked them to warn the maids and the queen. They were to lock themselves in their rooms, and the palace doors were to be bolted. Then the two main suitors tried to bend the bow. Eurymachus failed like all the others, and Antonius, even though he used tricks to try to bend the bow, also failed. Antonius told the suitors to leave the task until the next day. That way, they could go back to feasting at Odysseus' expense for one more day. At that point, Odysseus, assuming the form of a beggar, asked them to let him try to bend the bow. The suitors were outraged by the beggar's insolence. If he succeeded in bending Odysseus's bow, they would all be humiliated and their reputation would be ruined. Telemachus bravely opposed the suitors, telling them not to disregard the designs of the gods, which required that guests be treated properly and that the beggar would have the right to try. Eumaeus gave the beggar the bow, allowing him to try. To everyone's astonishment, Odysseus managed to bend the bow with ease. The disguised king took a deep breath and aimed. The perfect shot went through the twelve axes, to the disbelief of the suitors. The beggar said that, if Apollo was favorable to him, he would manage to hit a target that would leave the suitors even more shocked. Odysseus shot an arrow at Antonius, who had a cup in his mouth. The arrow pierced the cup and struck the villain's neck. The king of Ithaca revealed himself to the suitors. At that moment, due to Athena's blessings, Odysseus was glorious. 
as in his golden days of bravery in Troy. His son Telemachus, with spear and shield, stood beside him. Eurymachus, realizing the mistake he had made, tried to negotiate and guaranteed that all of Odysseus's dilapidated possessions would be returned in time. Gold and bronze would be offered in abundance until his anger was appeased. But the rightful king of Ithaca said that all the gold in the world would not stop his vengeance. Eurymachus advanced against Odysseus, drawing a dagger, but was killed by an arrow shot by the king. Odysseus's great battle against the dozens of suitors began. His enemies were unarmed, for Telemachus had hidden all the weapons that had been left exposed. Odysseus did not waste any arrows. As if inspired by Apollo, the silver bow archer, he shot down the suitors one after another. The arrows ran out, but there were still dozens of enemies in the hall. Telemachus was defending his father's flank with great bravery and ferocity. Odysseus and Telemachus were at a great disadvantage. Realizing that Odysseus was beginning to falter, Athena encouraged him and told him to remember that at Troy, he faced and defeated a greater number of enemies more skillful and fearless than the suitors. Inspired by the goddess, Odysseus, Telemachus, the swineherd and faithful servant Philetus fought against the suitors, eliminating them one after the other. The goddess shielded them against any mortal blow. Odysseus's victory was absolute. All the suitors were dead. The palace hall was filled with corpses, and there was a pool of blood on the floor. The old maid, at Odysseus's behest, brought Queen Penelope to the reunion, but she could not believe that her husband had returned. Only a god could have overcome so many adversaries. She remained silent before her husband, whom she hadn't seen for twenty years, without looking him in the eye. Odysseus, disappointed by the cold reception from the suspicious queen, demanded that they tidy his bed, for he wanted to rest. Penelope decided to test him and asked the servant Eurycleia to take Odysseus's bed to another room. Odysseus, realizing how cunning his wife was, said that such a thing was impossible. He had built the bed for the couple using an oak tree. It would be impossible to move it because of its great weight. Penelope's eyes sparkled at that moment, for only Odysseus could know the details of how the bed had been designed. Penelope threw herself into the arms of her beloved husband, for whom she had faithfully waited for his return for twenty years. They went to the couple's bedroom to make up for lost time. During the night, Odysseus told Penelope much of his adventures. On orders from Athena, Aurora, the goddess of dawn, took her time to appear so that the couple would have more time for themselves. As the new day dawned, Odysseus felt he had returned to the place he should never have left. His place in the world was not beside great kings or gods. It was there, beside his beloved and faithful wife Penelope, and his son Telemachus, who gave him such pride.